This is the Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. Hello and welcome to episode 53 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. Welcome to an entertaining discussion of the week's developments in clean energy and transportation. If you're new to the podcast, this is something we do every week on Wednesdays. We talk about how the world is changing, Brian. And this week, we have the Hyundai Ionic 5. Uh, which is good news coming out of uh, Korea, but there's also bad news as well. The EV price wars are heating up in Japan, and you're going to be very surprised by that because it's crazy. Uh, Washington State, another state, another jurisdiction, is banning new fossil fuel vehicles by 2030. How are you doing this week, Brian Stockton? How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. It's uh, it's warmed up, uh, great weather, although uh, my roof leaks every spring. I don't know about you, but... I've been in this house 12, 13 years, and almost every spring we've had leaks. I, you don't know about me. I'd be doomed if my roof leaked. I don't think I'd be able to afford to fix it, and I would die of mold. The problem is we we spend money on it every single year, and nothing has fixed it. So, you know, I don't know. At this point, I'm just accepting it. You have a flat roof. There are disadvantages to flat roof, which you've discovered with solar, uh, because uh, they, they sort of ice up and stay that way. And it's kind of the same with... Was it fair to say it's the same with uh, ice buildup, or is it just because you don't have insulation, enough insulation? And it's not flat. It's low slope, so it's almost flat. Right. But um, I don't know. It's partly ice buildup. It's partly condensation uh, because there isn't enough insulation. I don't know. I, I, it's, we've, I think we've fixed some of the problems, just not all of them. Our friend Jay had a flat roof on Albert Street on the south end of Regina. Uh, yeah. It wasn't that old of a house, but it was, uh, yeah. I, I would not want a flat roof. I, you know, the more angle there is, the more pitch there is to a roof, the less bad things that can go wrong, I think. I think so, yeah. I remember Jay telling me about his flat roof. He had to get some guy to come out and work on it. And, and the guy said to Jay, oh, so you got kingpins in that thing? And, you know. <laughs> What's a kingpin? I just like the jargon. I don't, Jay didn't know what that meant. And, but it's, I don't know, that always stuck with me. Yeah, I, I, if anyone knows what a kingpin is, email us now, for gosh sakes. Come on. Anyway, Brian, uh, let's get to it. The Texas thing has been um, festering. And I'll tell you why it's festering. You know, the the, the right wing bl- blames the, the news media for being fake news. <laughs> well, I think those of us that are not in the right uh, or environmentally minded are getting a little perturbed this week how... The news media has covered the Texas uh, non-issue of wind turbines not working in cold weather. I guess uh, an op-ed in the Global Mail by, um, what's his name, Rex Murphy, who's... What would you have to say about Rex Murphy? Because he he used to be liked when he was on national uh, public television, the state broadcaster here in Canada, CBC. Now he's gone downhill. Is he just old? Has he become... um, Is he reading Facebook too much? Because he he was allowed to publish an article saying it was the wind turbines. So, and then that, you can't take the back that misinformation. Yeah, that's where it gets distressing is when uh, when they're given legitimate news outlets. Is it the Globe and Mail or is it the National Post? I, 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 I avoided it, so I don't actually know. That could be. I really enjoyed the Globe and Mail back in the 90s, and it's been kind of steadily downhill since then. Yeah, it was the National Post. Uh, but still... Uh, they they should know better. Uh, I mean, they're right of center newspaper, but still, we were not. This isn't the Murdochs here. They used to, they should have some journalistic standards. And uh, the Edmonton Journal did uh, a piece as well that I wasn't able to read because I didn't have a subscription. Um, but it, it's it's there as well in the Edmonton Journal. Um, BS misinformation, which is not helpful. It's not going to help anyone it's not going to slow down fall it's not going to slow down green energy and it's not going to um make anybody happy if they don't know what's actually going on yeah it's just uh it's just extremely distressing because yeah these changes are going to happen anyway but uh you know be better if they happen without half the population angry about it (laughs) i don't it's so stupid that it's even an issue. I mean, you can say that uh, I don't want to put my tax money into it, but you're putting your tax money into fossil fuels uh, in a ridiculous way now 
Uh, they're still doing it, and uh, they're still uh, the oil companies are exploiting it. I was reading something about that this morning in the states. The money earmarked for small oil companies was going to the big ones, and uh, it's just an ugly mess. I mean, if we put that money into um, renewables, we'd be able to. Well, you, you, no one's going to say take the mon- take the subsidies away because people are going to start losing jobs right away. And in Canada, here where we are, it's, people are going to cry foul right away. But um, I, I don't know. It's just it bothers me, and it bothers me that it's a political issue because it's happening one way or another. And uh, the consensus for most people, for most of the population, and you can sort of see that in Canada now, where the right wing parties are going along with uh, some more. They're not. Be- terribly unenvironmental about things, at least at the national level. Would you agree? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, here's the thing I was sort of wondering about, because we were talking about Tony Seba last week or the week before, and of course, he's got his solar, wind, and batteries plan where, you know, in 10 years' time, that'll be the absolute cheapest and really the only choice as, as people work on their um, electricity grids. And of course, one of the issues in Texas is that they have a completely independent grid, which we talked about last week. They don't talk to the neighboring grid, so they can't bring in power from neighboring states because they um, they wanted to avoid the federal regulations and be a completely free market type system. And that's one of the things that got them in this uh, problem. But I was kind of thinking about the Tony Seba thing and if it comes to pass, solar, wind, and batteries, like he's talking about, we probably could have more completely unregulated grids, right? Like once yeah. power is so plentiful, that's that's when you could actually open it up and have a completely free market grid. It, it'll actually work because there'll be so many more uh, choices and so much energy storage. It, I, to me, it doesn't seem like a very complicated thing to grasp, but... Uh... Maybe for the average citizen, they're not paying attention to grids and and green energy, and it's all a big mystery to them. Uh, But you hear a lot of talk about uh, Canada, you know, we could be a big player in the EV revolution for batteries. Well, I think more batteries are going to go to grid storage than EVs. Is that fair to say? I mean, eventually, there will be enough EVs on the road, say by 2035. There's enough EVs on the road. There's robo-taxis everywhere. People are stopping to buy cars like they used to. Uh, those batteries then get recycled, uh, almost 100% of them, uh, and you're not mining a lot extra. I, I think a lot of the growth will go into uh, bringing the grid to net zero by 2050. And I think <laughs> I think batteries will be, um, there'll just be an infinite demand for them once they hit a, hit a certain price point, which we're very close to. Because, uh, I mean, let's, no, let's I'm going to take that back. We're at it now because you cannot get a, a power wall tomorrow. You know, you'll have to wait in line to get one because they're putting the batteries in the cars. Not only, we talked last week about, boy, howdy, Texas will, will want power walls from Tesla and, and solar to, to be grid, to be blackout proof. Because even if you did have power last week, if you're one of the lucky people to have power, you got a $5,000 bill, which is ridiculous. Yeah, you're thinking, woo, I got power. And then 5000 you're paying a lot of money for that power. I think that, Brian, that everybody, um, not just in Texas, but everybody who's watching Texas is going to say, hey, um, maybe this could happen to me. Uh, I should get a power wall, too. And then once you start doing that, you start distributing the power, and the grid actually becomes more stable once you distribute the power like that anyway. No, and I remember hearing statistics about the number of generators sold in the U.S. So there's reliability problems in more than just Texas, in the U.S., and really around the world. Like, you know, we all have power outages. But the sale of, like, diesel generators have been selling like hotcakes for the last, like, 10 or 20 years in the U.S. because, yeah, people are getting tired of the the blackouts. But, of course, batteries will be an, an even better solution. Yeah, and they'll become cheaper and cheaper. And uh, and hopefully uh, power utility companies will give you uh, incentive and make it easier, cut the red tape to be able to get those and... Uh, Hopefully the safety mechanisms from preventing power from going back into the grid, which could uh, hurt a a person repairing that very grid, uh, will become more reliable or or at least proven and uh, trusted. And uh, yeah, so that's, I don't know. I, uh, I, I, myself, I'm thinking, gee, you know, we had minus 42 degrees here. Uh, What would happen to us if we lost our power? Um, My dad died uh, 33 years ago, but before he died, for some reason, and I was too young to ask him, but he bought some sort of 
gas or kerosene heater for the house. I don't know how it would work or if it, it could have even been a generator. I don't think it was. I was told it was a heater. I think he was worried about the Cold War and, and something like that. But there was some sort of paranoia he had about that. And uh, maybe I'm just getting old. I'm getting to his age and uh, I'm starting to worry about these things. But I don't have a gas fireplace. You have a gas fireplace. But, you know, we could lose gas too. I mean, theoretically, it, our gas is made not to freeze, but I have a wood burning fireplace, um, but it's it's the old style, so those are only about ten percent efficient. So you got to burn an awful lot of wood, yeah, uh, to get any uh, particular heat out of them. Ah, uh, I just I want to I want to stay warm. I want to stay warm. So Hyundai has released the Ionic Five. What do you have to say about that? Um, it looks very interesting to me. There's one thing that I want to that I, I got to ask you, Brian, is because mm -hmm. they're saying it's not a a CUV, a small crossover. They're saying it's bigger than a hatchback and smaller than a CUV, which is the way some people describe the Bolt, but the Bolt is pretty small. I, I'm having a hard time gauging how big this is. No, and you know what's weird is it has apparently a longer wheelbase than the Tesla Model S. Really? Like it, it's got a very long wheel, like it's the longest wheelbase ever for like a crossover or a hatchback type vehicle. So, um, yeah, I thought that was pretty strange. Well, uh, just before we went on uh, the air, quote unquote, this morning, I watched a sped up video on YouTube. <laughs> and it was impressive. Uh, I, I almost felt like playing it uh, for our listeners. Um, the seats will go into a recliner position. Um, that is to say... Basically, you could sleep in the car. They don't just go back like a normal car, but they, they go way back and uh, then rotate down. And even the back seats will go forward and reverse on power seats. And they've got completely flat floors, so it seems just very roomy, you know, if you're putting your feet around on a long trip or something. And they're advertising those recliners as if you have to charge your vehicle, you and your passengers should be comfortable and uh, you can have a nap or just read a book or, or whatever. I like recliners. I live most of my life at a recliner, which is not good for the uh, fat content of my ass. But uh, for otherwise, it's uh, I do like to be comfortable, especially in a car, especially if you're resting on the side of the road, too. No, this is a it's a really interesting car. It's going to be available apparently here in Canada by the end of the year, like October, November. So this is going to be a pretty big rollout. This is really the, I guess, the first stage of, of uh, Hyundai's new strategy for electric vehicles. Um, you know, as we've talked about before, they've already got some, some decent vehicles. Uh, there's some problems with the batteries, which we'll uh, get to in a second. But um, no, these are exciting times. This is going to be, uh, I, I think, a big, big car. Um, the... Uh, Unveiling video, I thought, was uh, pretty hilarious, though, so um, <laughs> I, I extracted a clip that we can play from okay, that. Okay, let's play a clip. This is the unveiling of the Hyundai Ionic 5. You might think you can't change the world, but what if you could? I can change our landscape by redesigning our clothes. I was always a dreamer, but I knew I could be a pioneer. And then I could take control of time and space. <laughs> that is weird, isn't it? So, apparently with the Ionic 5, you could take control of time and space. But there is what they call vehicle to load which is different than vehicle to grid, right? There, Aren't there outlets on this car? Can you tell me that? Yeah, they're touting that it'll be great for things like camping because you'll be able to run all kinds of electric appliances uh, off the car. It sounds like it's got a like a, a ro really robust charging system too. It's going to have super fast charging. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it seems pretty great yeah, to me. Yeah, this ticks all the boxes. One of the things that... One of the boxes that gets unchecked for me uh, when I'm looking at a car like this and saying, will this work for me, uh, is the charging speed. And But this has a pretty good charging speed, doesn't it? Yeah, it's up to 800 volts, apparently. So this is this is definitely Tesla type of speed for charging. Well, isn't it 350? Doesn't, won't that take it to 350 kilowatts? It's yeah, potentially faster than 
Tesla, but uh, we'll see in actual practice. It, these things are always so theoretical, yeah. and those maximum rates happen for such a short time that... I don't know. It's it's a bit weird to compare them, but and it also depends on the efficiency of the vehicle because like the Porsche Taycan, Taycan has really fast charging, but the car is so inefficient with its batteries that the Tesla is actually still faster to charge because it needs less charge to do more. Right, and uh, yeah, I saw a chart that uh, showed a. Um, I tweeted it out on our Twitter account, uh, Clean Energy Pod on Twitter. Uh, uh, showing uh, the comparison between thousand kilometer trips and the the uh, the ratio between um, charging and driving and Brian, I was very disappointed in that. Most of the things were were sub eighty percent, so it, you know it was uh, less than eighty percent driving. And the rest was charging, and that was so many cars, and there was very few that uh, because for me, you have to be above that eighty percent. You can't. Uh, drive for 10 hours and spend 50% of the time or 60% of the time or charging or something like that. You know, only you have to, it has to be reasonable even now. Yeah. So the charging speeds are still not really where they need to be, I guess is what you're saying. So I, I don't know, uh, exactly what the, um, the passenger volume is in the car. I don't have that before me, but I'm really impressed and shocked that it will tow 3,600 pounds because that's what a medium size some medium-sized SUVs do is 3,600 pounds. Uh, some will, will have that stat, and they'll say, well, we'll pull a 5,000-pound boat because it's uh, more aerodynamic. But they're saying 3,600 pounds, which would do me, because uh, my trailer is, I have a, a, a fairly large uh, pop-up camper tent trailer uh, that is uh, 1,800 pounds, but then you got to factor in the passengers. That has to come off that. Um, the fact that I'm overweight has to come off that. Like they put a 160 pound driver in the car, and then anything beyond that, you have to take off your towing weight because that that's the, <laughs> uh, you know. And we pack everything, including the kitchen sink, when we go somewhere. Um, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, I, I even pack a solar panel. So that's impressive as hell because some of these other um, crossover SUVs are coming out with uh, 2,000 pound. 1,500 pound towing capacities, which is not useful, uh, not terribly useful for anything real. But this is a real towing capacity, which means it's a, it's impressive to me because uh, that's, like I've said a thousand times on our show, towing is the hardest thing you'll ever do with a car. No, and there's no confirmed pricing yet, but um, Electrek here is speculating that it's going to start around 30000 U.S. dollars, uh, go up to 40000 Those are excellent That'd prices. After rebate. This is, you know... Uh, falls in line with the, the EV price wars that we've been talking about lately. The new Chevy Bolt is 5000 less than the old Chevy yep. Bolt. So uh, these are really uh, exciting prices for sure. Yeah, and th you can put a converter. I think the converter is optional, but you could put a converter on the charging port of the car and then use that to get uh, 3,600 3, watts, which my, my charging of my car is 3.3 kilowatts, 3,300 watts. So I could charge my Leaf with this Hyundai Ionic, Hyundai Ionic at 25 kilometers an hour. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I wouldn't want to do that, but and there wouldn't be almost no situations where I would need to do that, but you could, and you could. Or the power goes out in your house and you can hook up yeah. a few heaters or something to help keep your yeah. house warm. And, and not just uh, not just a little light bulb. <laughs> You could hook up, you could keep your freezers going, like you say, and, and uh, uh, the furnace. And uh, it, uh, I'm telling you, in the world we're living in, in climate change and zombies and everything else that's out there, uh, yeah, it might be a good idea to have an electric car that can go both ways. Uh, however, uh, in our regular segment, what do you think? What do you think? I'd like to ask you, what do you think about Tesla saying that they're going to void the warranty if, on your Tesla if you're trying to use it on your home, to use power for your home? What do you think, Brian? Yeah, that story came out just recently. If uh, Yeah, if you know what you're doing. So, I, you know, Hyundai has built this capability into the car where, you you know, they're expecting you that you can right. power big appliances and everything. Uh, Tesla doesn't build that into the car, but you can kind of, there's workarounds uh, but if they find out that you're doing it, it is technically in violation of the warranty. 
I mean, I think if you don't tell them, they're not going to know necessarily. Uh, well, but, the, well, they have it um, on their stats somewhere on the computer. Yeah, but it goes in line with what they were saying previously about uh, vehicle to grid. Well, you know, shouldn't this be built into the car so you can use your uh, car as like a power wall, as, you know, battery backup for your house, or, you know, you've got extra solar, charge your car, and then use that to power your house. But one of the reasons they haven't done that thus far is that it just means a lot of extra cycles and a lot of extra load for the battery. And it makes sense. Like the car is warrantied as a car. So if you use it as a car, it follows the warranty. And, you know, there's a certain number of years and kilometers on your battery warranty. Uh, but if you're using it for all these other things, then it, it's going to wear out quicker. So it, it kind of makes sense that they don't necessarily support that with the warranty. All right. If you're just joining us, then you've hit the wrong button on your podcast player. This is the Clean Energy Show. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. If you're just joining us. <laughs> um, this is What Do You Think, where I ask Brian what he thinks, because these are a a list of items that I'd actually like to know what Brian thinks about. So uh, Tesla solar roof is coming to Canada and Europe as soon as this year. Brian Stockton, what do you think? Yeah, I would like to rip off my entire roof and all my solar panels and replace it with uh, a Tesla solar roof and, and once and for all fix my leaking problem, but I probably won't do it. You're getting old. You have a leaking problem. Um, so... <laughs> You want to stay in this house until you die, right? Until you drop. <laughs> Is that, that's correct. Right? Well, that's fair, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd kind of like to move to the West Coast, but, you know, I, I don't know. I don't see that happening anytime soon. That's possible. I mean, your Tesla stock, we can check on that. Uh, let's just do that now and see what the odds are of uh, Brian moving to the West Coast, which is warm here in Canada. We're talking Victoria or are we are talking Vancouver? Um, probably Victoria, but who knows? Well, good news, Brian. The uh, stock is up 3.84% today or $26.87. It's sitting at 725 which on the week isn't terribly impressive, but uh, it's rebounding. It's rebounding. You could make it to Victoria somewhere. It has been uh, actually quite a slide, uh, like 20% slide in the last uh, few days. So nice to see it recover. Any idea why? What's the theories going around on that? No, there was, uh, I don't know, a lot of the tech stocks are down. So it's just sort of some sort of overall trend, I think. All right. Uh, Brian, um, Tesla has likely already made over $600 million from Bitcoin. What do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't have a huge opinion on Bitcoin, but it is... Uh, you know, it makes mu as much sense as dollars. Like, you know, it, it, m all this money is imaginary. Like, you know, the dollar has a value because we all agree that it has a value. So if enough people agree that, that Bitcoin has a value, then it's got a value. Okay. This has been another edition of What Do You Think? What do you think? Brian, Washington State is banning new fossil fuel cars by 2030. Uh, that's impressive. It's uh, outdoing California. Yeah, good for them. I mean, it's just uh, there's one of these announcements pretty much every week, but that one is a uh, that's a pretty major one. We should have uh, a special segment for these announcements with a you know an intro and everything. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, Tesla's been adjusting the price of a lot of their vehicles, which is uh, quite interesting. They caused a bit of a stir because they only recently added the Tesla Model Y standard range to their options that you can buy. And it was on their website for just a few weeks, and uh, then they removed it, and everyone was confused about what was going on. And uh, apparently it's still available as a special order item. So it's not on the website, but you can phone them and order uh, the Tesla Model Y standard range. Um, this is the lower-priced Model Y. It is... Less range than the Model 3 standard range, and, and I think that that makes Tesla a bit nervous that the range is a little bit lower than they really want it to be. Um, but they've also adjusted the prices of the Model Y in the U.S. and in some other countries, most notably in Japan. Not in Canada, unfortunately. Our prices are still seem to be the same here in Canada. But uh, the price adjustments in Japan, I thought, was newsworthy because uh, they lowered the prices as much as 24% for Tesla vehicles in Japan. 
So now uh, the base, the lowest Model 3 is actually cheaper than the Nissan Leaf that's in crazy. Japan. So that's what I say when the EV price wars are, are starting to heat up. The fact that you can get a Model 3 in Japan cheaper than a Nissan Leaf is pretty crazy. And it's sort of, it's turning the tables on Japan because that's really what they did to North America in the 70s and 80s. They came into the market here with a big splash mm -hmm. offering really, uh, at first, kind of cheaper cars at a cheaper price, and then eventually excellent cars at a cheaper price. And uh, Tesla's now turned the tables. They're going into Japan uh, at a lower price. I thought that was pretty amazing. And something we're keeping an eye on here is China coming into the North American market, which they are starting to do. And we expect cheap prices and we'll see about the quality. I, I think they'll have a better running start with the quality than most people think. Um, but that remains to be seen. But definitely price disruption there. Yeah, and it takes a long time for people to develop, you know, loyalties around certain brands. Like there's there's still people that, that have a stigma about Hyundai and Kia, as we've talked about before, because, you know, when they first came into our market, you know, the cars were a bit cheap and, and not great. Um, you know, they've much improved, but it, it, it's still people's opinions about cars and car brands change pretty slowly. So I think there'll be a lot of skepticism for the Chinese brands when they first come in. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think they're going to be pretty good. It, it did take, it takes about 10, 12 years just to get going uh, when uh, Japanese cars came here. And the, <laughs> I've said this before, but there, I still saw a stigma. Uh, with older people in my mom's neighborhood who would say, well, how do you get a part for that thing? Doesn't it take, like, uh, come over on a ship? <laughs> no, it was made in Tennessee, you idiot. <laughs> the whole car was made in Tennessee. The part comes from, like, Kitchener overnight or in an hour, you know, like if you needed one and you wouldn't even need one. So I, it's, 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 but that's probably a, a, a racial bias and a nationalistic kind of weird sort of attitude towards other countries and cultures. Uh, and I still see that with my relatives in Alberta. Uh, <laughs> as I'm laughing, but it's an uncomfortable laugh. I want everyone to know that. Um, so, yeah, the uh, U.S., Brian, has officially uh, entered the climate accord. It took 30 days for that to happen. Now they are officially in it. But, the you know, I'm wondering about the Japan thing because um, – you know, a Tesla Model 3 is superior to a Nissan Leaf, a new Nissan Leaf. New, new, new Nissan Leafs are, are nice. Uh, they don't charge well on the highway. You can get two charges before they really slow down and get overheated because they, they don't have active heating. Um, and uh, they're obviously not tech-equipped quite the same way that a Tesla is. Uh, so that's not even – do you think that people are just buying Nissan Leafs in uh, – in Japan, and they're not buying uh, Teslas? Well, everybody has brand loyalties, and obviously Nissan is a huge brand in Japan. So like we were talking about, it's going to take a long time for these attitudes to, to change. I mean, I think anybody who looks closely will realize that the Tesla is a better buy, but it's also a different form factor. The Leaf is a hatchback. A lot of people like hatchbacks, including myself. You know, if you don't want a sedan, uh, you know, go for the Leaf. I wonder what the Model Y is doing. In, you know, I haven't heard hardly anything about Tesla in Japan. Have you over the years? No, this is kind of the first I've really noticed it. Um, the Model Y is just still not widely available. It's really only available in the U.S. Right. Uh, and Canada. And, you know, it's not going to be available in Europe until they start making them there. Uh, they might start shipping them out of China. Uh, but the Model Y is still kind of, you know, hard to get outside of North America. And as the current uh, White House press secretary says, I'm just going to circle back here to the Hyundai Ionic 5 that we were talking about. Uh, it turns out that that's not going to be available for us in North America for some time till at least next year. Um, they're going to start it in um, in Europe, of course. Europe gets everything because they have the biggest regulations. And then probably your uh, zero emission states like California and other places that need to have those vehicles there. So it's kind of sad that we won't get them. I wish they could mass produce these things and get them out there. It makes me think. Yeah, they don't sorry, want to. I misread that because I think I said that earlier on. I said it would be coming to Canada late in 2021, but I misread that. It's 2022. Yeah. So it'll. 
uh, Hyundai is notorious for being slow uh, in rolling these things out. Uh, wh- what is the, you know, like they're doing this massive battery call. Um, that's a pretty big thing. Have you read that today? Yeah, that was the other. Uh, so some more bad news from Korea, followed by more good news. But uh, yeah, there's been an issue with battery fires, um, you know, also with the Chevy Bolt, because they're using basically the same battery packs, but the Hyundai cars, the Hyundai Kona. And uh, yeah, they've announced a massive recall in Korea. This is so far just in Korea, uh, but they're going to replace the batteries in 21,000 Ionics, 236 buses, and 32,000 Kona EVs. They're going to bring them all in and replace the batteries. This is a massive recall with a massive expense. Um, but I think more than anything, it's you know we still have constraint on battery supply, which is I think one of the reasons that Hyundai has been slow to roll out these cars. So unfortunately, they're going to have to use some of their battery supply just to replace what's going on. Um, in the cars they've already sold. Uh, Chevy, meanwhile, with the Bolts, so far they have not announced a similar recall where they're going to replace the batteries. They're trying to fix it with software. Um, and so far they, they think that they can do that without replacing the batteries. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm kind of skeptical. I have a feeling that, that Chevy's going to have to do a, a similar recall. Really? That would be very detrimental once we get into the GM doing that. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. Um... Yeah, because it's bad for the perception of electric vehicles that, uh, you know, early on to have to do these massive recalls, it, 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 and it plays into everybody's misconceptions. They all think, well, the cell phone in my, my, my cell phone battery doesn't last, so these car batteries aren't going to last. It's, it's, not, it's not a great look. No, and uh, I hate, I, it's like the wind turbine thing. They, bad news sticks and bad, bad news spreads. Yeah. Um, and we hate to see that, uh, but it's, that's the way it is. Brian, I've got breaking news. The uh, Tesla co-founder, J.B. Strubble, will recycle Nissan Leaf batteries at his Redwood Materials uh, facility. So now they moved from Tesla batteries to also Nissan Leaf batteries. So those will be recycled. I'm still kind of actually surprised that anyone wants to recycle a battery because you take out the little modules from those packs and you have something useful like uh, you know you can add them up and make a an off-grid house that is uh, apocalypse proof or something like that or uh, for hobbies or different things or they used uh, Nissan would use them to power a street lamp at the mountains where they couldn't get electricity yeah well there's reuse and then there's recycle so you know hopefully these batteries get reused first and, and put into different products but Obviously, as we've talked about before, I think battery recycling is going to eventually be uh, a really massive industry. And other breaking news, Bill Gates all but admits that he was shorting Tesla. Are you shocked? That's Electrex take on uh, some comments that uh, Bill Gates had said. Basically, he said, I wish I was long on Tesla back then. That doesn't 100% mean he was shorting, but, I mean, we all wish we were long on Tesla at one point, and we'd be wealthy and moving to Victoria. Yeah, and he... It's odd because he's got a book out now uh, to try and ta- tackle climate change. That's his latest uh, yeah. thing. He's trying to uh, fix climate change. So slightly odd that he might have shorted Tesla, but I guess he can afford it. I mean, you know. Why does Gil Bates? You stand to make a lot of money when you short something. So maybe he saw uh, a, a chance there. I thought he was all about giving away his money. That's what he said in all eight night shows. Why do you want to short a company? I mean, that's just... Uh especially a company that's trying to change the world. It doesn't make any sense. It seems crazy, but, you know, at one point he said something about that uh, electric semis would never work. So I, I think maybe he got some bad information there that, and maybe he thought that, you know, Tesla had announced the semi and he thought that he had the inside scoop that it was never going to work. Um, maybe something like that. Brian, I am not smarter than Bill Gates. You can't sit there and tell me that I'm smarter than Bill Gates. Because I know that Tesla semis are going to work. Why can't he? I mean, it takes five minutes to do the research. Come on. Well, go back in time a bit. Think about when the Tesla semi announcement first came out, because this is like at least three years ago now. Um, And when they announced it and with the specs, you know, anybody with a calculator was starting to, you know, kind of figure this out. And at the time they announced it, based on what was currently available for battery tech, 
it did not look good for the semi to exist. But of course, Tesla was working with their 4680 battery cells in this in their calculations and in their announcement. They just kept that part a secret for a few years. I remember the CEO of Nikola, uh, which is now uh, practically toast, said no. Is defy like he was really pissy on uh, Twitter. I I unfollowed him. <laughs> I, I I didn't respect him uh, after that at all because he went very uh, petty on Twitter and said, no, no, this can't be possible, it can't be possible, and he was very childish about it. And, um, yeah, now look where he is. So, yeah, um, don't bet against Tesla, people. Um, you will get burned. And there's one final good news story now from Korea. There was just tons coming out of Korea this week, but uh, the South Korean government is working to lower the price of electric vehicles. They say that they're hoping to have the price of electric vehicles by 2025. So the South Korean government is really getting behind the electric vehicle efforts uh, in that country. And, uh, you know, they've actually put some targets on it, like I say, trying to cut the price in half by 2025. So South Korea and what, you know, we've just announced with uh, Hyundai, the new vehicles coming, uh, South Korea looks like they're going to be a huge player in electric vehicles. So that's interesting. You can, as a government, you can you can make electric vehicles, vehicles free if you want. You can just pay for them. You can make them, a, but they must be doing something more than that. They must not just be giving you... Um, twenty thousand dollars American for your vehicle. They must be. Are they trying to? Uh, well, the f prices are coming down for batteries, and twenty twenty five is is that place where they see battery prices falling significantly by then. Hopefully, yeah, they're trying to do this with different tax benefits and subsidies. They're basically just trying to support the industry, right? Um, and uh, that's good. I, if you want to read more about it, it's you know. Electric has a good story uh, on it. Just look for South Korea um, having their vehicle prices by 2025. It's, uh, yeah, it's exciting stuff. So the uh, Globe and Mail had an op-ed by the editorial board, which is maybe why I was confused about um, that other editorial coming from the Globe and Mail. It came from the National Post, uh, Rex Murphy. Um, they the, the gist of the editorial was about uh, EVs are coming and you have a little bit of time to prepare oil industry, but don't be stupid. That's the gist, if I was to summarize it up in one sentence. Um, I'm just going to go through it, okay? So they said that they used to, uh, the talk used to be around here in oil country about peak oil. Uh, when, you know, when it, the prices went way up and, and people, demand went way up and is, are we going to have enough? When are we going to start running out? We always used to talk about that. I remember talking about it with my relatives in the oil industry a decade ago, as recently as then. Uh, and it's always something that we, you know, because we, in the EV world, before all this started to happen, we would look at peak oil and say, okay, when oil goes away, we will have to make that transfer. So, but now it's peak demand and Shell or BP, rather, said that it might have happened in 2019, one of their three outlooks. We've talked about that before. That was a big news last year. The Canada Energy Regulator says uh, peak could be in 2035. And in my opinion, Brian Stockton, 2035 is the absolute latest that it will peak under the best case scenario of all the scenarios. And even the oil companies aren't really saying 2035. Their, at least their median predictions are uh, in this decade. So uh, we export... $90 billion of uh, oil per year in Canada, which is a lot of money. And the point is, we're not going to have that money. That's going to start to go away. Not completely, but it's going to start to go down. So we're going to have to rejig our economy and our expectations. The oil sands uh, are in a somewhat good position for the transition for a little while because they don't require new investment after they get going. So the, a lot of oil you have to keep investing in new rigs and new drilling and exploration. At least with the oil sands, um, that's going to go steady for a while, and then it's going to go away. Um, the U.S. Energy Information Agency says oil demand will fall from 9.3 million barrels a day in 2019, that's before the pandemic, uh, to just 8.9 in uh, 2020. 22, post-pandemic, when everything's recovered, they're saying that oil demand is already going to be down significantly. Um, 
you know, that's more than 10% uh, of a drop. So that's pretty significant if that pans out. And Biden, by the way, has proposed 500,000 uh, charging stations, they point out in this op-ed by the editorial board uh, by 2030. That is more than there are gas stations now. Uh, Brian, I, I think it's weird that they're even talking about doing that because you don't need as many gas stations if you're charging at home, right? I mean, some people in apartments and condos can't, but uh, by and large, people charge at home or work. Yeah, it, it's a little difficult to imagine a future where um, all cars are electric. So, you know, maybe we would need it. And of course, there's people that live in apartments who can't charge at home. So, you you know, you have to take that kind of thing into account. So as they well. have an interesting example here. Um, as you know, Norway, if you've watched the Super Bowl ads, Norway is uh, big on electric vehicles. Their new electric vehicle sales are a vast majority um, now have a plug on them. So they're not, you know, there's still one in 10 vehicles are only electric in Norway. It still takes a while to electrify the fleet when you have a policy like that. However, in 2019, um, they... This is also before the pandemic. Their dependency on oil dropped 3.3% in one year. And you could say that's small, uh, but it's not. And then they say, this is what we have to look at in the future. This is what the Global Mail is saying. We have to look at uh, when every other country starts doing this, and it's going to happen soon. Um, you're, that's what we have to look forward to is uh, small but steady declines. So, yeah, two-thirds of the oil burden in the United States, for example, is for transportation. So two-thirds of that will start going down uh, now, at least the demand. I know there's growth uh, involved here with other markets, but it's going to start going down. No, and it's just going to be a difficult change to, for people to wrap their heads around because it's been nothing but growth, of course, for oil uh, you know, in the last hundred years. I, I, I remember you mentioning this to me. Uh, this is getting back to Texas. You said the mayor of Colora Colorado City, Texas, which I didn't know existed. It's like Texas City, Colorado. Why do they do that? Just they, they need to change these names. Yeah, it's confusing. It's confusing yeah. Kansas City is not in Kansas. It's crazy. Uh, I, I can't keep track. You, you were saying that they were telling the citizens that there's nothing the government can do to help them. This is a mayor of a city in Texas. What's the deal with that? Yeah, it was just kind of a, a funny story because he, he went on a rant on uh, Facebook about how, uh, I don't know, the I'm going to try and find the right quote here. It's, it's something like, you know, these utilities don't owe you anything, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious because, I mean, if you have a contract with a utility to supply you power, then, in fact, they literally do owe you something. Power, but, for example. Uh, I mean, it... it this is the, you know, free market kind of mentality that exists in Texas. And, you know, it, it works most of the time, um, but just not in this instance. And, it, yeah, it was just funny that the mayor of the city was um, <laughs> going on a rant about how, what, I'm just the mayor. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Get replaced by someone else. I noticed the uh, mayors in our city of 200,000, Regina, Saskatchewan, had um, people saying uh, the the was disclosed that who paid for what in the marital uh, race, who supported the politicians in the last uh, election in the fall, and it was all car dealerships. Did you see that? Why are car dealerships so intent on supporting mayors, or is it just because they're the only ones making yeah. money there? That was. Uh... That was surprising. Yeah, I, I don't and quite get that. they don't disclose it until the election's over. Did you see the uh, the Tesla Sentry mode uh, capturing a woman running after a Model 3 while it was getting summoned, thinking it was a runaway car? Did you see that? Yeah, I could see where somebody could be quite alarmed if they saw a car rolling through a parking lot without a driver. So, uh, yeah, I feel sorry for that woman. She's and trying to she's help. all over the internet. <laughs> but, yeah, she's a good person. She tried to help. Uh, me, I would just say, rolling car, not my problem. Um, let me get into mining, take my groceries home. Um, I'm, I guess I'm surprised that it hasn't happened before, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of people submarine. Yeah. Have you ever summoned your car in public? No, I haven't. But there was another story from a few years ago where, um, you know, the early Tesla Model S had two kind of jump seats yeah. in the trunk. 
like it's kind of a sedan, but there was there was enough room to put these two kind of child seats in the trunk. So there was a story from several years ago where somebody was watching across a parking lot, saw them open up the trunk, put two <laughs> kids in there and phone the police because they thought, oh, my God, this guy's putting his kids in the trunk. Because they couldn't quite see. Oh, I thought you were going to say they were kidnapping yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, putting kids in the trunk. Absolutely. Like, that would be alarming if you thought that these two kids were going into the trunk. Well, hopefully, Teslas are uh, common now, and people will say, okay, Tesla, it drives on its own. And not everybody's going to know that, obviously, especially in the States where the education system is terrible. Just terrible. I'm kidding, United States. I'm kidding. <laughs> I like to make jokes. Um, yeah, so I, I just, um, the Tes the, um, Volkswagen is coming out with uh, the ID electric vehicle, the ID5 coupe version of the ID4. I don't know why it goes up in numbers but gets smaller because the 4 is an electric SUV and the 5 is smaller. So I associate larger numbers with bigger, don't you? Am I wrong? Yeah, naming schemes for products is always weird. Um, every company has their own method and then often they don't stick to their own method. Yeah. The Clean Energy Show Lightning Round. The Lightning Round hits James against Brian in a flurry of headlines from this week's news. Let's begin here now, James Woodingham. Tesla is to add 35 gigawatts of solar and wind power capacity in just the next two years, as well as 10 times more storage. Uh, the result, renewables are widely distributed, decentralized, reliable, and resilient, as you know. And the more renewables there are, the more resilient the grid is. Is Texas moving in the right direction, Brian? Yeah, no, that's uh, obviously a huge step in the right direction. Um, as we've talked about before, you know, Tesla's trying to grow at 50% per year. So, you know, that includes battery storage, solar, like all of these things. And it's not just them, of course, the whole world is trying to expand this stuff at a massive rate. So we're going to see incredible numbers pretty soon for, you know, storage and solar, I think. Brian, Bitcoin is becoming a thing, but it uses a lot of electricity. But there is a upside to that. If you are using a lot of electricity for Bitcoin, you want to use it cheaply. If you want to use it cheaply, you buy renewables. If you want to buy renewables, you buy solar. You want to buy a lot of solar, it reduces the price of solar. Is that stupid? That's kind of one of the arguments for Bitcoin. Yeah, and the other argument is that, you know, the whole standard, the regular financial system uses a, a ton of power, but we just don't, don't know. Like, it can't actually be quantified how much power the traditional banking industry uses. So I think the argument is that Bitcoin is actually going to be similar or maybe less than the, the standard. But there's certainly an argument out there that um, there'll be, you know, other cryptocurrencies are more energy efficient. So perhaps there will mm. eventually, you know, emerge another winner, <laughs> like somebody that's got um, a more energy efficient uh, cryptocurrency might eventually end up on top. By the way, I had an email from a listener who said, if you want to get back at Brian on being rich, uh, I can tell you about Bitcoin. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't resent Brian for being rich. I depend on him for being rich. He's he's <laughs> the the uh, the core of the show, the corporation here. And uh you know, the fact that we'll be broadcasting from an island one day uh, is just uh, icing on the cake. So Ford dealers may be forced to pay for the next generation EV certification. That is something that uh, um, Ford is widely putting out their, their first mass produced vehicle, which is the Mustang Mach-E. Uh, Nissan dealerships still in Regina, where we live, are not, and there's only one here that have paid the I don't know. I guess it's like forty to eighty, maybe even a hundred thousand dollars in some cases to get certified, get the equipment for EVs, and they may force those dealerships to do that, which is good for us for what we're looking for. Uh, tough for some people, though. Yeah, as we've discussed before, it's the, you know most of these traditional car makers probably have too many dealerships, so uh, perhaps Ford will do something similar to what Cadillac did, and you know it'll be such a large payout that they have to pay to, uh, you know, pony up to sell the electric cars that maybe there'll be a, uh, you know, some of them will just shut down. And by the way, the Tesla price drop of the Model 3 in Japan is 24%. I just can't get, get over that. That's something like we need to know what's going on there. Elon, tell us. I know you're listening. Uh, give me an email. Uh, China 
is the second large China's second largest courier, SF Express, is going to buy thirty thousand e-bike frames by the end of this year, and uh, as it starts using China Tower battery startup swap service. So I, I I wish I could show you the picture. I don't have it in front of me, but it's it's like a it's like a communal post office that's really big, and. Um, it's like got these these elongated cubes that you stick in. So you just open up the door of the post office thing, stick the cube in, it charges. You pull another one out, stick it on your bike, and you're a courier. Yeah, well, of course, battery swaps have been talked about a lot for electric cars, and uh, Tesla tried it a little bit, and there is a uh, Chinese car maker that is doing battery swaps for the cars to avoid the sort of potentially long charging times, but it makes way more sense for bicycles, because you've got fairly small battery packs like that, that, uh, yeah, you can just easily swap in and out. So, yeah, battery swaps for, for electric bikes, that's that could be amazing. There's 10,000 of these battery cabinets in 100 cities. For This is a big deal. This is not just a, a trial and error of concept. It is the real thing that is massively been put out there. And, uh, yeah, you could use that. The thing I'm thinking is you could use that for uh, a community bike program, too. So you wouldn't leave the batteries on the bike in the rain or whatever or, you know, they're high value. Uh, you go, you stick your credit card on the machine, you get the battery out, you plop it on a bike frame. The bike frame unlocks its wheels and you go. So I wonder if that would work. They're fairly substantial batteries, too. So, I mean, you wouldn't be doing any pedaling, uh, too much pedaling with that. You know, Brian, I can't wait to get my e-bike out. I uh, I can't. I, I'm looking really looking forward to it again. Especially since somebody on YouTube uh, told me how to hack it, <laughs> so I could I could go faster. I had a terrible accident last year that knocked at least twenty points off my IQ by hitting my head. Thankfully, I had a helmet on; I'd be dead. Um, and now I want to go faster. So, yeah, I've been thinking about it. My family says no. Uh, don't do it. I say yes. I can't. I'll try it somewhere safe. They said to just tell the um, bike that the wheel size is smaller uh, so that uh, it'll think it's going slower than it is and you'll actually go faster. So uh, I'm very heavy, so we'll, it's not going to propel me uh, like it would a, a normal weighted person. But uh, uh, we'll see how it does and we'll report on the show. So, and this is because in different countries, there's different regulations regarding e-bikes. So, uh, yeah. some countries, they're software locked to well, a they all lower are. speed. Most of them are, yeah. Yeah. And Europe so, is 25 kilometers an hour. Uh, here, it's 32. So, I feel lucky because 32 is a nice speed. Uh, it's, about as fast as, <laughs> it's about as fast as I would like to go at my age. <laughs> Since my body doesn't heal very well, which I found out in the summertime, uh, it takes some time. I'm probably still healing. I'm looking at my my elbows and uh, lost a lot of skin. It's still on the on the road there in the park. But uh, ouch, ouch! I hate bike accidents. Um, but yeah, that's just. <laughs> I can't wait to get out there. I want to go to the winter time, but it's too icy. I need those studded studded tires like you have in your Tesla. So Lucid yeah. is going public. That is uh, one of the new up and coming car makers. They've been around for a while, and they've got four billion dollars. What do you think about that? What's your investment advice on Lucid? I don't know. It still seems a bit risky. Uh, they still don't have their car actually out and available. So. Um... You know, it remains to be seen, you know, which of these new players, I don't know, I'm more partial to Rivian, although I'm not entirely sure why, but they seem to be a little bit further along and maybe a bit of a better bet. They really seem to have their crap together, Rivian. Like they really, they're really on, on the ball. They've went out and they've, they sold a hundred thousand units to Amazon and um, they've got a compelling product. And they're coming. I can't wait to see one. I can't wait till them to come out. It's, it's, it'll be here soon, Brian. It's like March, April, May, four months, four months, four months will go by fast in a pandemic. Um, electric snowmobile and watercraft maker Tega is going public through a SPAC deal, and it is raising $100 million. I believe they're Canadian. So they make snowmobiles. Uh, most people probably don't know what a snowmobile is. <laughs> uh, actually, most people probably don't even know what a personal watercraft is, but it's, uh, they're kind of the same thing for different, same size of thing. Um, 
yeah, I just I'm excited by by everything being electrified. I would love to have if I had a snowmobile, Brian, I would want it to be electric. If I had a water personal watercraft, I would want it to be electric. It is you've got a cabin by the lake, so things will get quieter because well, they have gotten quieter over the years, but they used to be really noisy, but now uh, they'll even get quieter. Yeah, well, I can tell you a story about because I was at the cottage this uh, past weekend. Uh, but yeah, Taiga is a, you're right, Canadian company that's going to be making uh, electric snowmobiles. So I am excited about that uh, possibility. But yeah, I went for a walk out at the lake last weekend on the lake itself. Oh, and, really? And uh, there was tons of snowmobiles around because there was a bit more snow this year. So, mm-hmm. you know, the cross-country skiers were out and the snowmobilers were out. And so I'm taking this nice walk on the lake and then a whole pack of about eight or 10 snowmobiles just <laughs> b- blasted past me. And it was kind of a, a fun kind of sight, you know, it, like a motorcycle gang, but on <laughs> snowmobiles. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And it's a bit loud, but whatever. But then about a minute later, about a minute after they passed, then the smell hit me from the exhaust from uh, all of the uh, snowmobile engines. And it was it was disgusting. It, it, it ruined the whole thing. It's, you know, you go to the lake to be in nature, not to, to sniff exhaust fumes. And that is going to be true for a lot of machines that are used for nature, starting with motorcycles. I know motorcycle, motorcycles aren't exclusively used for looking at nature, but it is one of the advantages of having a motorcycle. It's the only reason that I would ever want a motorcycle it would be to, I'd love to go through the mountains, through the Canadian Rockies on a motorcycle and not die. <laughs> But uh, that would be a, or a really good – e-bikes are getting so powerful that uh, you'll probably be able to do it on an e-bike at uh, at a decent speed if they'll let you. And um, and then there's ATVs, all-terrain vehicles and things like that, and uh, e- boats and everything that, that you use in nature like snowmobiles and personal watercraft uh, will get quieter and – and, I, and I'm willing to bet that the stinky part is probably worse than the noise. Yeah, it always kind of ruins the lake for me. And so we tend to like going out in the spring or the fall or the winter more than the summer because the summer just gets noisy and busy. And, and at that time, it's, yeah, the jet skis, the personal watercraft. And they're, they're noisy and smelly as well. Well, Brian, it's been a good talk. That's all the time we have this week. I can't believe how fast it goes by. We were going to do a half-hour show when we started this. Now an hour goes by too fast. So we'll see you next week on the Clean Energy Show. See you next week.